He'll lead it to Derek Martin. Over to the big fella, Keith Close, drive and hammer duck with a left hand. First trip. Introduce yourself. Keith Claus, a.k.a. Boss Claus, world's number one shot blocker, Clipper <laughs> Nation. Here we go, L.A. Clippers. Do you know his name by any chance? Uh, I don't know his name, but he's nice. for the Clippers. Can't make video, video, you know. For the OGs that did a dime, came back around on parole. Uh, for the homegirls with the scrap game, yeah. little homies that gang bang. From Pelican Bay to YA, rearrange your mind frame. Yeah, I know what you've been through. Uh, Shit, you had to go tend to. Your mama gave birth on the turf. I know them killers you kin to. This for the lost generation. Broke as hell, mad and impatient. But if you know your history, you can't have a strong foundation, baby. Can't make video, video. You know, this is for sure. Still hold the high school, I mean the college record for block shots, right? Yeah, that ain't going anywhere for a while. You know what it is, 5.8 or something like that? Something around there. Where'd you grow up at? I grew up in L.A. in Baldwin Park. And... Bret Hart University. Bret Hart? <laughs> Bret Hart University. I live right around the corner from Bret Hart. I lived on uh, 92nd of Vermont. Okay, all right. Uh, how you get hip to kill Mac videos? I was over in China, man, and you know, we, we get bored and we look for things to, you know, back home to entertain ourselves. And uh, came across this shit on YouTube. So I said, let me check this out, and see what he's talking about. You know, once I saw the direction you were going, it was, it only made perfect sense to go ahead and start support. Man, let me, um, let me know how how tall are you? Seven three. When did you first start sprouting up that you remember? I was always taller than everybody else. So, you know, uh, especially high school, that's when I really started hitting the biggest growth spurt, six four freshman year. Then that summer going into my sophomore year, I hit six eight. So all the new clothes that mom had bought me over the summer for the next school year I couldn't even wear. You know, um, 6'11", my junior year, 7'2", my senior year in high school, and his 7'3", my freshman year in college. And you was running with the guys in the neighborhood back then or not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nine Deuce Hoover, you know, and uh, but I spread myself around all of them. So, you know, they knew me from four trays all the way up to the 11 deuces. But was you getting in any trouble back then? Not publicly. Okay. You know, uh, I was smart because uh, I watched a lot of the old heads and, and learned from them what not to do. So, Any in particular that you looked up to? Lil Zoe from Nine Deuce. Uh, shit, my boy uh, Magic, Big Buddha. And, uh, and then from the 50s, I had Ann Capone, you know, and, uh, and Gangsta T. Chili, Roscoe, those are my niggas, my main niggas right there. Well, you helped hook me up with Tony Stacy. Where you know him from? I never met T.S. personally, but, you know, everybody growing up in L.A., especially if you're from the culture, you, you, you're very familiar who he is. I grew up in South Central L.A. all my life. Uh, when I was on the east side, I grew up in the Nixon Garden, uh, grew up in Watts. Uh, after that, uh, we moved in 98 to San Pedro during the Watts Ride days in 1965. Then uh, we moved from there, moved to uh, 80th in Maine, and uh, 
between Broadway, 80th of Maine, between Broadway and uh, Maine. We moved around the corner to 80th of Maine. Uh, then I, we moved to 84th Street and Broadway, and then we moved to 84th Place. Then was all my stomping grounds when I grew up. It's ironic because my mother worked with his wife for the city of L.A. for years. And, uh, you know, I used to always tell her, yeah, that's the big homie, that's the big homie. And so when when I saw what you were trying to do, I said, man, we need to get our history out there. So let me go ahead and reach out to T.S., get that number for you. All right, so now you're in high school and you're playing basketball. Varsity, right? Yeah, only one year varsity. My, my junior year, man, uh, coach told me he had enough talent and uh, turned me away at the door. So... I made my name playing down at Venice Beach where I learned how to play and then playing in the AAU circuits, giving everybody buckets. Explain to the people from out of town what goes on at Venice Beach as far as basketball. Venice Beach is a mecca of uh, L.A. basketball. You know, it's kind of like Rucker Park. Um, you know, everybody who's anybody plays down there. You've got all kinds of characters. You know, a lot of playground legends played at Venice. A lot of rough basketball. A lot of rough basketball. You know, it's going down. And then you got you got uh, the occasional bangers that like to go through, you know, and uh, walk around with their chest puffed out, showing off for the girls as, you know, rollerblading around with the thongs on and whatnot. But uh, once we hit that court, man, none of that shit matter. So when and how do you get into college? I was recruited by damn near everybody. But, um, you know, they wanted to red shirt me because, because of my, my size, because I'm so thin. They thought that uh, by sitting me out a year, I would, I would beef up, you know, but I got a high metabolism, man. So I ended up signing with Central Connecticut State University. I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a project baby. You know, uh, Marcus, Al Marcus uh, Camby, a uh, longtime NBA player, played for the Knicks, played for uh, the Rockets, you know. He was... Uh, one of my neighbors, you know, we used to play crate ball. So I went back to Connecticut to go be with the rest of the family and chill in the projects. And you get drafted to the NBA? No. No? I didn't even get drafted, man. I got calls from Philly and Seattle on draft night talking about they are going to pick me. But they passed me up. You know, I ended up signing a free agent contract for $8.5 with the Clippers after playing with the Lakers and the Summer Pro League down in Long Beach State. Gave everybody the business. And, uh, you know, Elgin Baylor and Bill Fitch, who was my, my coach my rookie year, they're sitting there at the, one of the games. I'm walking back to the locker room with Kobe. Said, uh, son, if you ain't signed with the, with the NBA team at the end of the summer, you're going to be wearing an L.A. Clippers uniform. And I just looked at Kobe and kind of chuckled a little bit to myself because I grew up a Laker fan. You know, nobody gave a damn about the Clippers and what they're doing. But, uh, yeah, end of the day, you know, the Lakers roster was full, so I signed with the Clippers for the financial security. So what you had, a three-year career? Three years, man, out of a five-year deal. I got suspended for my fourth year because of all my little, you know, extracurricular activities. <laughs> you was a fuck-up, in other words. Basically, yeah. <laughs> so look, man, when you get to the NBA, you got, uh, you got, uh, you know, you got all-star players from their high school or from their college. And you get on the court, did you really see a difference in the players? Did you think everybody was good or was some obviously better than others? There were some that were, you know, a great deal better than others, but everybody specialized in something. So, you know, that was the reason why they were there. And I still felt like because of my versatility on the court, being able to do different things, growing up playing all five positions, you know, I, I thought I was, you know, I thought of myself as a special case. So I always looked at myself as being better than most of my competition. Being a rookie free agent, did you expect playing time? Hell yeah. You know, when they, I, I wasn't familiar with the politics of basketball, professional basketball. So, you know, I thought that, uh, with them signing me for basically the same amount that the number four pick got, you know, I'll be getting out there, you know, doing the damn thing. And so uh, what happened is you weren't a starter in the beginning, were you? Nah, I got a reality check. You know, it sat me at the end of the bench from the, 
from the get go. Uh, I played for Bill Fitch, who didn't believe in playing rookies unless your name was Larry Bird. You know, so it was more about paying dues, sitting back and learning, you know, and uh, accepting the role. And like you said, before we get to the NBA, all players that are at that level now, at one point in time or another, we were the man on our team. So, you know, having to sit back and be told to accept a certain role that's, you know, different from what we're accustomed to, that was a difficult adjustment to make. And it was one that I bucked against. So, look, there's, there's a point in time when you were a rookie and a coach put you in the game. And you go six for six and the coach pulls you out the game. How did you feel about that? And why did he pull you? Man, we played against Cleveland. My rookie year at the sports arena. And uh, I'm going against Big Zajunas so Ogaskis, another 7 3. He's a little slower than me, although he's skilled. And uh, the coach told me from the jump when he came and got me off the bench, he said, Look, all I want you to do is play defense, grab some rebounds. That's it. And I look back at the bench and my teammates, like, Yeah, okay. And uh, they gave me the nod, you know, so I knew it was on. I went out there, man, showed my ass real quick. Six for six, busting his ass. You know, I had the sports arena going crazy. And uh, the very next dead ball, coach meet me at half court, cussed me out all the way back to the end of the bench. God damn it, that's not what the fuck I told you to do. If you want to play, you need to learn how to follow directions. I just refused to adapt, you know, to, uh, I, I refused to accept that role, that menial role that he tried to give me. So do you think he was a good coach, or do you, you think he was had an ego problem? What was it? Uh, you know what? He's a good coach with an ego problem. You know, he won a championship with the yeah. Celtics. So, you know, everybody who has a championship, as a whether you're a coach or a player, you're going to have a little bit of ego because you separate yourself from, from the rest. So how long did he last as a Clipper coach? He was there for a few years before I got there. Um, so I got I just got to be with him for one year. They got rid of him. The Clippers weren't that good when you got there, though. Man, you know what? Nah, we were trash. You know, and um, on paper, we had, a, we had a, you know, we had a team full of ballers, but we were playing for the, you know, during the Donald Sterling era, man. And that was rough because uh, he wasn't really trying to do nothing to help us win. And us players, we wanted to win. We all competitive. You know, I got Rodney Rogers, Lamont Murray, uh, Lorenzo Wright, rest in peace. Uh, Mo Taylor, he was a hog at Michigan. You know, guys like that. Eric Piekowski, who, who could shoot the lights out. I played with Brent Berry for half a season, you know, before we traded into Miami for Ike Austin. We had dudes that could go, man. Uh, Charles Jones. A scorer out of out of uh, New York, man, who he just knew how to light it up. But that wasn't the role that they assigned for him, you know. Tyrone Nesby, uh, man, we we had some we had some dudes that could go, but management really stayed in the way and ended our progress. There are times when they would come down out the stands, man, and pull guys out the game for one reason or another. Sometimes they were just mad at us because they saw we were, you know, trying to do something, and nah, you're going against the system. So go on, sit your ass down for a minute. So when y'all got a new coach, your record got even worse, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Chris Ford, mm -hmm. understudy of Bill, Bill Fitch, mm -hmm. you know, ignorant dude, God bless his soul. We got into it a few times. You know, I got Native American background, and uh, I wore my hair, and I braided it on the side. I had a mohawk you know, just paying tribute to my grandfather. And uh, he gave me a hard time about that shit, tried to make me take it out, you know, and I, I refused to. And uh, so, you know, dude basically sent me home, you know, had me sent home, you know, they asked me if I was trying to be like Dennis Rodman. Nah, this is part of my heritage. I'm just showing respect to, you know, my roots.